Your big moment in the sun. There you go. Rachel Bender, my very special guest. She is from the Bethesda House of Mercy, but that's not exactly your title. So tell me quickly why I understand this. All right. We are the Community of Jesus, the Living Mercy, and I am the Community Director. We are a lay community in the Diocese of Cleveland. We received our canonical status uh, in 2008 on the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas from Bishop Lennon. And our ministry is called Bethesda House of Mercy. And we've been in ministry since 1990. What exactly is your focus? Our mission is very simple. We provide spiritual companionship, healing, and support for anyone who's suffering after an abortion. What makes you different from the many organizations, the many ministries out there that deal with post-abortion issues. I'm really glad that you asked that question. Yes, I'm a professional. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because what we provide is uh, we, we understand that those of us who have experienced abortion. Those of us? Yes. Those of us who have experienced abortion. You. Me. We, we look at it that the abortion took place within a much wider context within a person's life. And so abortion is really a symptom of a much greater problem, a much, uh, a, a much more difficult problem in their life that led to the abortion to begin with. So you got the pre-abortion factors. That's it. But you guys, okay, you can deal with that somewhat. Yes. But it's the post-abortion stuff. Right. And you seem to say, when we were talking before, it reverberates. Yes. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that the reason why women choose abortion is because their life is already in crisis. And by the time they come and see us, it's, it's like it's if, as if your life was a bunch of puzzle pieces thrown all over the floor. You no longer know how any of those pieces go together. And so you need companionship you need more than just a 12-week Bible study you need a long-term companionship with someone who can be a loving presence in your life so this to isn't help just you your basic the counseling together. in an office no no it's a spiritual companionship although we do provide we have a psychologist who works with us and a counselor but the the work is peer-to-peer -peer, where you have someone who's experienced abortion has experienced healing and they meet with someone who's coming for healing so it really is a relationship healing takes place in the context of a relationship we come to know that we are valuable we come to know that we are more than the sum of our mistakes when we experience the mercy of god in the presence of another person tell me how you uncover some of the stuff that is this you used a word for it a phrase for it rachel what was it generation yes well when when we're looking at where we are today the accepted figure on both sides of the issue is that one out of every three women by the time they're 45 in our country has had at least one abortion so what that means is is that abortion really has become the family secret like sexual abuse was so many years ago now abortion is the family secret we see women who come to us of all ages the oldest woman that ever came to see us was in her 90s i received a phone call from a woman whose abortions took place when she was in the refugee camps during world war ii we have to look at abortion not just 1973 and onward but we have to understand that abortion has been widely practiced in our country since the 19th century so we're talking about generational a generational problem where it's not just the young girl who's had an abortion but it's grandma it's great grandma it's my great aunt this is the family secret that nobody wants to talk about because of the shame that we feel after we've had an what abortion. What do you see as the main reverberation? Okay, plenty of folks out there talking about all the psychological ramifications of an abortion. Yes. But you're saying that something when someone is 62 years of age yes. that seems to be unrelated mm -hmm. 
to this abortion that happened when they were 19. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you uncover that? How do you pick up on that? What do you see? If you're in a relationship with someone, I think, first of all, we have to be really careful not to try to diagnose our family members, our friends, our neighbors, and our coworkers, um, because we can certainly make mistakes. But I do think we need to be sensitive to when women are struggling with depression or anxiety or substance abuse, because those things seem to be uh, more common in those who have had an abortion. That doesn't mean, of course, that you can't be having depression and anxiety and substance abuse and never have had an abortion. I'm just simply saying that, that in that, within that population, that does higher seem percentage. to be higher percentage. That's right. But I, but I, I want to be cautious that the, the way that we can respond to family members, coworkers, neighbors that we think may have had an abortion is by being a merciful, loving presence in their life. You don't have to bring up a past abortion to initiate a relationship with them. But we have a responsibility as Christians to be God's face of mercy in, in our lives. And that is the invitation. If we're someone who's safe to talk to, if we are the face of God's mercy, then that person, if they're beginning to feel like, you know, this is something maybe I need to, to begin to look at, you'll be the one that maybe they'll entrust to you this secret. What about the guys? Uh, the guys seem to be a small piece of this puzzle. It seems to be the, the woman's struggle or the women, woman's move. What about the guy? What do you see of the guys? There has, I've been involved in post-abortion ministry since the early days back in the 80s when this was all beginning to come, come to the surface. Throughout all this time, there have been many attempts to establish ministries specifically for men, and they've risen and fallen. And part of the reason for that is not that guys aren't hurting, because they are. The reason for that is because it is, it is much easier for a man to compartmentalize. And he is, as long as his life is at a certain functioning level and things are kind of working for him, he's able to shove that abortion off back here. And a woman can't do that, but he can do that. So I think what we're seeing is even though men, are, it's slower for them to come forward, I think we'll make a big mistake if we think that they're not hurting. And how do we know that they're hurting? If we look at the explosion of sex addiction in our country, the use of pornography, all of those are signs that something is really wrong and broken in men. And I, I believe that shame in a man is felt far more deeply than in a woman. Because when a man makes a mistake, when a man fails to protect his, his, his beloved and to protect his child, it calls into question his very identity as a man. What does it mean to be a man? And I think that shame uh, shatters him. One final quick question. Yeah. How often do you see someone who at the time of their abortion, guy or girl, didn't bother them? They thought it was an okay thing to do. Culture said it's okay, it's legal, no problem. At some point, they come closer to Christ. Yeah. At some point at age 36, they have a spiritual re reawakening. Mm -hmm. Is that when it starts to hit hard? I think in what we see within our own ministry, when women are hitting midlife, when the nest is being emptied, and now she can no longer be distracted by the busyness of child caring. And, and now she's, she's facing herself and has the quiet in the house to do that. That's when these things begin to bubble up. So most of the women we see are, are nearing their 40s and are older. But I want to I just at least address that one point that... Um, not everyone who's had an abortion is going to say that, that they regret it or that, that this is something that they shouldn't have done. In fact, we would say that most women, if you ask them just that question, that, that might be the immediate response that they give you. Um, we are, and it, it may not just simply be a psychological denial either, but what we're facing now in the pro-life movement is we're facing that we are in conflict with two worldviews. One that says, I am the master of my own life, 
I decide what's right and I decide what's wrong. And even if I might regret my abortion, doesn't mean I didn't do the right thing. There's, there's a worldview that's very strong in our culture now for that. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of room then to begin to express the grief and guilt of an abortion experience. The summary says there is reverberation. Some places where you don't see it. Some places where one's psychological makeup, spiritual makeup shifts. And then the stuff comes to the fore. And it often isn't till decades later. Be sensitive to it. Rachel, thank you so much. Thank very you very much. much. Thank, thank you. you.